off as you can. So, uh, thank, thank you for, for, for all for coming out. Thank you, Daniel, for doing this again. Yeah. Could you turn uh, Jamal's mic up a little bit, please? Uh, oh, there we go. So, uh, you know, I've had the good fortune. We've, we've done a bunch of these, Jamo, almost every year at the Peach. We've done these at Wani. We've done them on the radio. And I just want to say, I, I, I never take it for granted, and I never get, I never get bored. So, thank you for doing this. And you know, just like no, no two Almond Brothers shows are the same, no two conversations with Jamo are the same. So, the pleasure as always. Yeah, this is great. Uh, he just don't do enough of it. <laughs> then I guess I'm not. I guess I'm not uh, healthy enough to do a lot of it. I need two or three of me. <laughs> anyway, let me see. Just cut out. It just cut out. It just cut out. Can you hear Jay Moore? It just cut out. We'll get this straightened out before we get going. Turn it down a pinch. Mm -hmm. uh, that should be good. Right there. Everybody you. can hear JMO now, all right? Okay, we're good. We're good. So JMO, before we before we get into the, the history of so so much history to talk about, but so many people were telling me how much they enjoyed Les Brères last night. Oh, that's great. And uh, Woo! I talked to O'Teal this morning, and he told me how much he loved it. So how, how do you feel about Les Brères? Is that, is that as much fun for you as it seems, looks like it is? Not yet. <laughs> uh, I've got quite a way to go with it. Um, yeah, I've got quite a ways to go with it. But, that's something to work at, so that's all I need. It's something to work at. I'm glad uh, you all like it. Does playing with Butch and Mark after not not playing with him so much over the last couple of years, does it feel at all like coming home, like your natural way of playing? Or? Uh, yeah. And Butch and I have been in that for probably six years or something. And Mark uh, in for about 25 or 30 of them. <laughs> just like your eyes, it's like blinking automatically. So you just know exactly what to play and, and how to fit in. It's like it's like a puzzle piece, right? Yeah. And I, I thought that the Almond Brothers had a big drum set up, but then I got on the stage last night and looked over when you were playing with string cheese. Oh, we had like okay. two full kits and two big percussion setups. How did, how did you find that experience, playing, adding some new uh, percussionists and drummers to the mix? Somebody asked me if I wanted to play which song, and I said, uh, Midnight Rider, uh, Ain't Wasting Time. And they came back and they said, uh, you're not going to play either one of those, you're going to play this. And I said, okay. <laughs> so then they came back and said, you're going to play these three songs. And I said, it's fine with me, I'll play all of them. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was fun playing with those guys. I had a lot of fun doing that. And it's something for you to look at. Uh, I guess the sound could have been a little bit better, but I guess it was as good as it was going to get. We could have done better things. We were going to get it on the stage, and I guess the rest was up to the guys pushing the buttons. But I had a ball doing that. So we, we talked about, I'm just waiting on them to ask me again. We talked about the most recent history last night. Now I want to go back to the very, very beginning. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but you know, Jamo was the first member of the Allman Brothers band before it was called that. So, uh, you know, when. And so, you know, I mean, just to make sure you all know, and if you don't, then you really need to get and read this book, but you should know this if you're here. You know, Dwayne, Dwayne Allman was. Uh, signed a, a deal with Phil Walden and was looking to put a band together. And the first guy he hired was, was J-Mo. And they were hanging out in, in Muscle Shoals. And the next thing that happened was uh, Dwayne invited Barry Oakley out. So the very first jams were you, Dwayne, and Barry. But 
and unfortunately there's no recordings of those. But what, what were you playing? What did the three of you get together and, and play? Because after those jams, all of you were so convinced you had something that became what we know. What, what, what was the actual music you were playing? What we were playing was the same thing that we played when we got with Butch, Gregory, and Dickie. We were playing the exact same thing. We just um, went from uh, doing it behind a vocalist with uh, three other guys. That's basically all we did. And that's why uh, I turned down quite a few impressive little jobs um, staying in band. Right. Once I was with Wayne, once I was with Wayne, we played one song and that was the end of it. And I finally figured out we were jazz musicians. I didn't have to, <laughs> I didn't have to go to New York to start the death. <laughs> so when you played one song with Dwayne, you decided that was that was what you wanted to do. But why? What was it? What did you hear in Dwayne in, in one song? That because, you because when you look in the eyes of a woman, and, you, and they call it love at first sight, and can't nothing in the world tell you anything else except when a man loves a woman, the same goes the other way. A woman loves a man. It can be even more dangerous. <laughs> and that's what it was. It was that 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 uh, that magnetic pull. That uh, it's the same thing that everybody else feels whenever something uh, like that happens to them. They say, "What is he talking about?" You you just mentioned uh, that you had turned down other jobs to stay with the Allman Brothers band. And one thing I don't think too many people know is when Paul McCartney was putting together Wings, somebody, I don't know if Paul McCartney himself called you, but somebody called you about playing in that band, right? The uh, band director, Tony Bone. The guy who played the trombone solo on uh, somebody's knock, no, somebody's ringing the bell to open the door. Yeah. That was Tony Bone playing it. Tony Vaughn and I played in Joe Texas band uh, together. And Princess Lidges man, Clarence Hart. We played a lot of bands together. Uh, he was a terrific guy. I mean, he was really a terrific guy. He does so many things, it's unbelievable what that guy can do. But he was an Air Force man for six years. Uh, and then he spent two years uh, in Baton Rouge going to school. Uh-huh. He didn't want to have a yet. But, uh, that's the kid he called me. And I asked him why he didn't call this friend of mine, Joe English. And he said, well, I called Joe. He said, Joe told me he was going out with Bonnie Brown. And, uh, he didn't want to do it. And I don't know what he heard him say, I almost lost my mind. <laughs> because he was turning down a gig with Paul McCartney to stay with me for with, with Bonnie Grammar. He was going to play for $150 a week with Bonnie for six weeks. And then he was going to play on the record with Paul McCartney. And Joe Eman. Yeah. Hell of a musician. Great person. Hell of a guy. That's it. And so I bought him a ticket and told him, if you have any trouble, go down there, I'll come down there. So did everybody get that whole story? <laughs> so Paul McCartney called J-Mo to play on his first Wings record. Paul well, McCartney's people called J-Mo. Yeah. Somebody called for Paul McCartney, asked him to play on the Wings record, and he uh, passed the gig on to his friend Joe English and bought him a ticket to go down there. And, and in a way, I wish that you had done that, J-Mo, only because um, I think that people have overlooked you and your importance, uh, it don't... Uh, are we back on? So, I think if you had played uh, a prominent gig like that with somebody like Paul McCartney, more people would have understood uh, who
who you were, how important you were to the owner. That's just my own, my own side. Uh, I want to talk for a second about, about you. you're welcome. Yeah. I want to talk for a second about Greg. We gotta get this thing straight. Yeah. Gregory. One of the great things about about talking about Greg with JMO is he always calls him Gregory. <laughs> and nobody else really does that. So Greg is on all everybody's mind now. We all we all send him best wishes. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what makes Greg uh, a great artist. Including his, his songwriting and his singing. What what's different about working with Greg and other people? Um, I don't know. Gregory is like um, just like any other musician that uh, loves what he does and what he's doing. Uh, any other person, period, is doing what he's doing. Uh, when we went to Alabama, uh, Dwayne and I, uh, he told me, he said, he said, man, there's only one song so and so that can sing in this band that I have in my head. He said, and that's my brother Greg. He said, oh yeah? Okay. And we went through just like guitar players. And yeah, he was right. Uh, Greg and I sing together and You played with Otis Redding, Joe Katz, Percy Sledge, all these great uh, R&B singers. Did Greg have elements of his approach to singing that was similar to those guys, or was he always a little different? Um, he's, he's got he's got all the uh, basically the same elements that he. Um, Gregory is like a, uh, he's a really good blues singer with the edge of that poetic writing that he does. And I think it, it's what makes, makes, uh, makes him a little different about it. And he, he's adamant about it. As long as he's running the show, he's adamant about it. You don't have to get disgusted with somebody not understanding um, about how he feels about something. He's, and maybe that's what, what's different about him, uh, the, way, the way he approaches the stuff. Um, so some words I never heard of before in my life, I hear some of Gregory's songs. <laughs> when, when you're playing drums, has it always been important to you? Do you pay attention to the lyrics of the song? Do you feel like you, you play to the to the lyrical content, or do you just listen to the music? Um, a little both. Usually, the uh, usually the lyrics are like something I try to get my hands on and get attention to. But usually they're usually the last name that I finally, I guess they are, they learn to like my icing on the cake. Uh, after it's over and done with, I can see all of the things that I've been able to do since I paid more attention to what the lyrics are like, what they're saying. In, the, in, in this band that I play in, uh, Jamie's Jazz Band, uh, Junior Mac has got this tune called uh, This is the first song on Renaissance Man. Right? No, the very first song on Renaissance Man. No. Anyway, it's talking about, uh, uh, here I am, I'm running, and I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what I'm doing. He has a door, one on the right, one on the left. Which one shall I choose? And it reminds me of the television show, The Box of the Curtain. <laughs> but once again, it's like, which one should I choose? And I listen to that stuff, and when I started listening to those words, it made me change 
whole lot of things about what I was trying to do uh, while the song is going on, and then and the, the little drum solo on this event is how much of it can you really play and stick to what the melody is talking about? Uh, so that's the the song. Uh, before the Roman Brothers band formed, before you met up with Wayne, you were getting ready to go to New York and try to be a jazz musician. And in a way, what you guys ended up with was a rock band with a jazz approach. And part of that approach, I think, is that each, each musician contributes their personality. Not just trying to play the music to, to back the singer. And, and I think what made the Allman Brothers such a unique band was that each of you had very different personalities and musical vision that all came together without anybody squashing their own vision. So, can we talk a little bit about each person in the band and what their contribution was? So, let's start with Barry. Uh, Barry, Barry Oakley, of course, the original bass player in the band. What, what did he bring? different to your mix? Um, I don't know. Except he's playing. And once again, he was one of those people, uh, just like um, Dwayne was when I, when, uh, when I heard uh, Dwayne had talked about how great he was and, and the rest of that stuff. And it wasn't until he got there that uh, and he would do something about it. Anyway, um, Lamar Williams had gone in the military. He was in Vietnam. And I told Dwayne we didn't forget about him. Um, and Barry turned out to be the captain. Now, one thing about that was, when Lamar went in the military, and so many bass players I played with, and along with me not really knowing how to play music and how to really play along with people and stuff. Um, I had a lot of problems playing with bass players. And then when I, um, I met Barry and we played, it was like all of that was lifted. All of that was lifted off of my head. And it was two, two, two uh, good lessons. One lesson about uh, chemistry um, and the other one about your ability maybe not to do a whole lot of things that you may think you know how to do. It's been a great, very great part of it. I know some part of you not being able to play with uh, some of these bass players. But, um, when Harry Oakley was like, Harry was like, uh, just a super musician. I mean, most of the people that I know are uh, music, music players. And I say this because a lot of the stuff that's going on today, a lot of the musicians in my band and a lot of the people that I played with is of this, it's like 25, 30 years ahead of what's going on right now. We were playing that stuff when I was in high school. We were, we were playing like that. Not, not, it's, it's, it's experience and it's hip, but that, that, that goes with the ideas. Uh, one day a friend of mine, George Baker, I asked him if he told me he had a hip hop gig. And uh, I said, George, what is hip hop? And he told me, he said, you remember that stuff they told us not, used to tell us not to play? I said, yeah. He said, it's hip hop. <laughs> we didn't know shit. <laughs> um, and it, it really, you know, it's all, it's all, all about chemistry in these things. Uh, I don't care what it is you're doing, what, what, what kind of uh, occupation you have, uh, a life in general. It's all about chemistry. Having the right chemistry makes things elevate a lot faster uh, than they do if you don't. Because you spend a lot of time wasting trying to figure out why this don't work and you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> you shouldn't be wasting your time doing it. So sometimes it doesn't work just because it doesn't work. Yeah. And that's when you shouldn't be doing it. So that, that's very Let's talk a little bit about, about Dickie Betts, because I feel like uh, with everything that's happened with Dickie, and sometimes his musical contributions get a little bit overlooked. So what do you think as a guitarist? 
guitar player and, and a musician, Dickie, brought to the original Palmer Brothers band that shaped the sound. Um, we said, uh, if you're not, what? You might get over it? I was just saying, uh, what do you think Dickie's, how do you sum up his musical contribution to the original Almond Brothers band? And, and it's an interesting thing about Dwayne that as, as a brilliant lead guitar player, one of the first things he wanted to do was find another brilliant lead guitar player to play with. Because usually guitar players are, you know, a hot lead guitarist like that, they're like brain surgeons, right? They don't want anyone else to like fighter pilots. So that, that was right away an unusual thing about Dwayne, you know, he had that vision to have someone else up on stage pushing him and working out different things. How would you describe what Dickie brought musically to the original album? Um,
to a win out in uh, Florida one time. And my, I guess it might be about maybe three or four weeks after I got the stage of the band. Well, it was it December 1960, December 1967? And uh, we played this club, and this guy was in that with Juicy. He was the musical director for this club. This guy was in this club. So he told the guy who to bring in and stuff. And then he would get the horns, ever uh, what, if, if, uh, if the person they brought in didn't have a, a band at that time. So I told Sledge, I said, Sledge is person Sledge. I said, Sledge, we need to hire this guy, man. He said, do you really think so, Jay? I said, yeah, we need to hire him, man. So when we left, Juicy was with us. And one day we went down the road, and he said, Jay, nobody said anything. And he pushed, pushed me in the back with his finger like, Jay, Mo. And I said, yeah. He said, I said, who's Jay, Mo, man? He said, that's you. And that's me. 1968. Okay. My legal name is Jay, Mo. Just know his real name is this, his real name is that. My name is J-Mo. So do you think of yourself now as J-Mo? Hmm? Do you think of yourself as J-Mo? Or do you think of yourself as Johnny? I think of myself as all of them. <laughs> Somebody else said, Billy Cobb, Hani Johanny Johansson. It's J. Johnny Johnson. <laughs> I, used, I used to be like that. Trying to make names be something that they weren't. <laughs> Uh, I do that. I still do that. I do that with music now. And I hear somebody else play it and I go, wow, the show is easy. What the hell was I thinking about? So this morning we were having breakfast and I asked Jay Mo if there was anything new or different he wanted me to ask him about today. And he said, uh, what I want you to do is take your book, open it to any page, and ask me about what's on that page. So we're going to do that. But I'm going to have... Uh, I want somebody to call out a number between one and uh, 400 and... Uh, <laughs> someone call out a number between one and 420. First one. 210. That's the first one I heard. So I don't know if it was first. I didn't say that. Let's see what's on 210, James. I said, open the book. And have a it comes to. Yeah. That's what we'll discuss. I didn't say I would talk about it. <laughs> you don't do book. Well, 210 is, that doesn't have, uh, 210 doesn't have much on it. It's a half a page, but I'm going to go back a couple pages. It's about uh, recording brothers and sisters and how uh, when Barry, Barry Oakley died, just a couple songs into brothers and sisters, and Lamar came, came on board. So uh, tell me a little bit about, about Lamar and how he adapted so quickly because the, the very first the tryout became a rehearsal, right? Yeah. Um, Lamar was was, um, was one of those one of those musicians. It's like uh, a lot of a lot of what we did was uh, we played we played we played music. And that's what we did. I mean, there's a few other things we did, but a lot of people used to want to be around us because, we, I guess because we played music so well. And then we found out, like, well, you guys do, why you don't ever talk? These guys are square. We played great music. We didn't say anything, we didn't say anything about the hip we were and anything else. We played great music. My mom quit the ninth grade because he made more money than his daddy did, playing in bars with, with myself and some of our friends. So his daddy told him he wanted to quit school, go ahead and quit. Because at that point, he was, he was bringing in uh, the bread. Um, I learned about playing the bass drum from my mom. Uh, one night he was, he was doing this stuff, which he's always doing. You know? One night I would happen to be listening. And I started trying to emulate what he was doing on my bass drum. 
and it was like so much fun. And it came to me like, this is what everybody's been trying to tell you to play, don't it? <laughs> and um, it was just, it was, it was so great. Uh, Lamar used to remind me a lot of this guy uh, who played on all that Motown, like James Jameson. Man, that he played. And he, he had years because Lamar really started playing, he was really a drummer in the high school band. He was a drummer. But, uh, he started messing around with bass because his daddy had this blues group, I think it was the Deep South Spiritual Singers, uh, out of Gulfport, Mississippi. He started playing around with his dad, uh, messing around with the bass. Next thing I know, he was like playing the bass. The next thing you know, he was the musical director for the group. <laughs> well, he was, he was such a cat, he was such a bright cat, smart. Lamar did uh, all of the vocal, did the, the voice parts for the stuff we didn't see them. Lamar did all the parts, all the background vocal parts. And, and just in case anybody doesn't know, you know, the vocalist in Le Brer is just Lamar Williams Jr., Lamar's son. So that's, uh, that's a nice closing of the circle there to have, to have him playing with you again. Yeah. Um, we're going to get to a couple questions. We'll do one more random page. We've got another number. 350. Alright, that's getting pretty deep here. <laughs> well, we're not going to talk about 350. I don't want to go there. Let's just say this. And now that, that now that it's been uh, almost two years since the uh, Alma Brothers played their last show at the BJ Theater uh, in October 2014, do do you miss it? And 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 if you do, what what do you miss? Is it the music, the crowd, the lottery?
you went to the studio, then uh, there's, a lot of this, there's a lot of things that you can even hear. A lot of times, uh, I just get so into it, my hands would be bloody from it. all kinds of crazy things. The good thing about it, I, I learned a lot of different ways, just like I said, more ways to stay one. I learned a lot of different ways to be able to do things. Different player. And I say the road goes on wherever. 